now we're at the point in our discussion of autonomic nervous system that we turn our attention to neurotransmitters and receptors and how they're going to function. Recall in our autonomic system we have two motor neurons. So we're going to be looking at the synapses between the pre and the postganglionic neurons as well as the synapses between the postganglionic neuron and the target tissue, muscles or glands. So first we look at our cholinergic neurotransmitters and so what neurotransmitter are we talking about when we say cholinergic? Acetylcholine. So our rule, and I love simplifying things as much as possible, all preganglionic neurons, and this is for sympathetic and parasympathetic, all preganglionic neurons secrete acetylcholine, and therefore all are going to be excitatory to the postganglionic neuron. That makes sense. If the preganglionic neuron is sending a signal, then you have to excite the post or else the signal is going to stop. So the synapse between pre and post ganglionic neurons is always excitatory and it always uses acetylcholine. We can also say all parasympathetic post ganglionic neurons secrete acetylcholine and most are going to be excitatory. We do have a few exceptions, such as when we see in the heart, acetylcholine is actually going to inhibit and therefore slow the heart rate. But most are going to be excitatory, but all parasympathetic postganglionic neurons secrete acetylcholine. Now, as far as the sympathetic postganglionic neurons, some of these are going to utilize acetylcholine. And these are going to be the ones that innervate blood vessels going to your muscles and sweat glands. And again, mostly they're going to be excitatory. And when you're doing scientific writing, you realize the value of the terms some and most. Because it's rare that you get to use the term all or none. Because typically when you do that in science, immediately somebody's going to find the exception. But these two exceptions, all preganglionics and all parasympathetic postganglionics, you can take that to the bank. All of those are cholinergic and secrete acetylcholine. So here's the graphic showing our preganglionic neurons, postganglionic neurons. On the left, we have the parasympathetic division represented as the single stack. Our sympathetic division, we have three, and we're going to talk about four divisions. We're only going to use three in our illustration. And if you're able to look closely enough, you will be able to see that in the synapse between the pre and the post, there are these green dots that represent acetylcholine, and then we have the green dots for our postganglionic parasympathetic neurons also secrete acetylcholine. For the sympathetic division, you just have to remember the exceptions to those. Now, just to remind you, our two types of, of, of cholinergic receptors, nicotinic, muscarinic. Nicotinic receptors always have to be excitatory because they're an ion channel. When you open them, ions change, you get an EPSP. However, our muscarinic can be either the excitatory postsynaptic potential or inhibitory because of our linkage with the G protein. So our G protein, in fact, can stimulate an ion channel to open, in which case we may hyperpolarize if that's a potassium channel and potassium goes out, that's going to inhibit or an IPSP. Or in other tissues, the G proteins may, in fact, close the potassium channel or open additional channels, such as for sodium and, and calcium, in which case that would lead to an excitatory potential. So do you see, because of using G proteins, it will depend on the tissue and depend on the ion channel that's affected, whether it could be an EPSP or an IPSP. So that gives us a little bit of fidelity and extra control when we utilize those receptors in cardiac muscle or in smooth muscle. Nicotinic receptors, we're going to find those exclusively on skeletal.
Now, in our autonomic nervous system, we also use catecholamines, and in particular, norepinephrine. And so we're looking now at the adrenergic receptors, and our rule, most of the postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic division, most of those are going to be adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic receptors also, many are G-protein linked, so it can be either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on the downstream ion that is affected, such that for norepinephrine-stimulated tissue, if we're stimulating the receptors in cardiac tissue, that's going to increase the heart rate. But let's say we have adrenergic receptors on the smooth muscle of our airways that lead to our lungs, the bronchioles. Adrenergic stimulation is going to be an inhibitory event, an IPSP. And when you relax the smooth muscles of the bronchioles, that's going to allow those bronchioles to open up or dilate so that you can get more air into and out of the lungs. So here is our example. We saw this uh, in the last chapter, <clears throat> our nervous system chapter. Adrenergic receptor, there's norepinephrine, G proteins. And in this particular example, we see that the intermediate adenylate cyclase is stimulated. Adenylate cyclase, remember, converts ATP to cyclic AMP, which is a potent second messenger. Cyclic AMP is going to activate protein kinases that then can activate ion channels. So the end result is similar to what we saw with our muscarinics. We're opening or closing ion channels. It's just the path to get there for our adrenergic receptors may be slightly different, may have a few more steps involved in getting us there. So we have two acetylcholine receptors, nicotinic, muscarinic. For our adrenergic receptors, we have four. And we're going to designate them either alpha or beta and one or two. So we have two alphas and two betas. So the alpha-1 adrenergic receptor, when it binds norepinephrine, it is going to cause a calcium influx. And so we're going to, we're going to open a calcium channel, likely binding to calmodulin in much the same way we've seen already in our axon and in smooth muscle. And the particular target we're going to see there is constriction of vascular smooth muscle. So the smooth muscle is going to be activated. It's going to constrict and it's going to decrease the diameter of that blood vessel. That's a principal action and location of the alpha-1 receptors. Our alpha-2 type of adrenergic receptor, we're going to see that we have these in our presynaptic membranes. And in some way, it's believed that this is going to provide negative feedback to the preganglionic neuron to know, okay, we've secreted enough or we need to secrete more. We're going to see that these receptors are also present in our vascular smooth muscle, and that's going to represent a postganglionic type of membrane. And we also see in the brain, we have a lot of alpha-2 receptors. And this is going to reduce the activity of the entire sympathetic nervous system. So norepinephrine being secreted by these postganglionic neurons, this is, again, a way that we can negatively feed back to our sympathetic nervous system to say, okay, enough's enough. Because when you think about a sympathetic response, it is extremely fast, it is extremely large, and you do not want that to go on for an extended period of time. My example of you almost getting hit at the red light. You white knuckle the steering wheel when that car runs the red light right in front of you, but you don't feel that way for the next two hours. So you go up real fast, and if everything's okay, you come down real fast. Part of that is due to the stimulation of these alpha-2 receptors and the negative feedback that occurs in our central nervous system. Now, our beta receptors, both beta-1 and beta-2, these are going to signal with G proteins and our cyclic AMP signaling. 
And we're going to see that these are very important with vascular smooth muscle as well as in our cardiac tissue. So when you stimulate a beta-1 receptor with norepinephrine, you're going to increase the force and the rate of that contraction. And think about it, norepinephrine is sympathetic. And what does your heart do in a sympathetic fight or flight response? Speeds up, beats harder. And it does so mediated through norepinephrine or epinephrine and our beta-1 receptor. Now the beta-2, when you have norepinephrine binding, it's going to inhibit the smooth muscle, leading to smooth muscle relax. That's going to be in our GI tract, our bronchioles. Why they also put uterus in there, I'm not sure the significance of that, but basically it's not doing anything. You relax the GI tract because it's not functioning. You relax the bronchioles because you want them to open as wide as they can get to get as much air in because you're going to do something extremely active. Heart rate increases and respiratory rate increases. So here we finish our illustration. We finish it out. We've got our preganglionics, cholinergic receptors. Here's our cholinergic postganglionic in a sympathetic system. And here are our adrenergic, our norepinephrine, associated with alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. They leave out alpha-2 from the illustration. I'm not exactly sure why. We had a seminar speaker last year that they now have additional numbered receptors. Simply hasn't made it into our textbooks yet. They have alpha-3s and beta-3s, I believe. They, they've been identified in other tissues as well. Now, we show you that not just to give you an appreciation of how the physiology works, the mechanisms through which these chemicals are stimulating certain parts of the body, but you have to have an understanding of how this works to be able to manipulate it to the advantage of your patient. And we do that by mimicking many of these chemical signalers. Now, some are going to inhibit the action of a receptor, and we call those blockers. And some are actually going to stimulate the receptor artificially so that we can have the benefit of that result. And so first, we're going to look at the beta blockers. These are going to be the adrenergic beta antagonists. An antagonist is a blocker. And the first one we see is propanolol. This was one of the first clinically widely used beta blockers, and it was to try to manage cardiac arrhythmias. Now, notice this says beta blocker. So if you give a patient propanolol, propanolol is going to bind to and stimulate which beta receptor? It's a trick question. Hmm? No, it does stimulate, but which beta receptor? It just says beta blocker, so it stimulates both. It stimulates both. Now, in some instances, that's fine. Some instances, that may not be what you want to do in stimulating beta 1 and beta 2. So essentially, by having this beta blocker and preventing your heart from speeding up, it basically prevents a sympathetic response in your cardiac tissue. It, in fact, does decrease cardiac arrhythmias. But what's going to happen if you block the binding of norepinephrine to the beta-2 receptors on the smooth muscle of your airways? What does stimulating that beta-2 do to our airways? Opens them up. So if you block the ability of that smooth muscle to open is that going to be a huge deal? And which patients are really going to need that? Now, it would suck if you had a cardiac arrhythmia and you also had asthma. But if you do have some of respiratory disorders, you better not give them propanolol. Because that's going to prevent them getting any sort of relief from some other pharmacologics we're going to see that can help them. Now, the other thing that we see with the beta blockers is by preventing a sympathetic response. Your heart rate doesn't increase. The force of the heart doesn't increase. 
And so it's going to have an anti-hypertensive effect. So your blood pressure cannot increase. So that's another benefit of having a beta blocker. It's not necessarily going to be given just for hypertension, but that's a benefit of slowing down the heart, correcting the cardiac arrhythmias, and it will have as a consequence to that, in a collateral effect, it will be anti-hypertensive as well. You have a patient. They have atrial fibrillation or they have ventricular tachycardia or even preventricular contractions. We'll talk about these when we get to the cardio section of the course. But they also have asthma or they have COPD. And this is an increasing problem in our society these days. Respiratory issues. You can't give them propanolol. So those patients are given acebutalol. Acebutalol is a selective beta blocker because it only blocks the beta 1 receptor and not the beta 2. You can see how that would have an extreme benefit to those patients that have the cardiac arrhythmias but also the respiratory issues because you're fixing one without damaging the other. Now, if there is an adrenergic pharmacologic that you are probably most familiar with, even if you don't have asthma, you probably have heard of albuterol. And in what form do you usually see albuterol administered? An inhaler. So think about our receptors, and if we're having asthma respiratory issues, the smooth muscle of our bronchioles are constricted. So we need to mimic a sympathetic nervous system response to get those smooth muscle to open. So we don't need a blocker. We need a stimulator. And so albuterol is going to be a beta-2. It's specific for beta-2. Otherwise, your heart would race out of control. It's specific for beta-2. But notice it is an adrenergic receptor agonist. An agonist is a term for a stimulator. An antagonist is a term for a blocker. So often these are referred to as rescue inhalers. When someone's having a massive asthma attack, they take a few puffs, causes the relaxation of the smooth muscles. They have a much easier time breathing. So here we have another agonist, another stimulator, and this is oxymethazoline. It's selective for alpha-1. It says partial for alpha-2, but we really don't want to fool with all the alpha-2s in the brain, not if we're just congested. So if you have nasal congestion, you grab a bottle of Dristan, Afrin, all these different kinds, and when you squirt that into your nose, it is going to cause constriction of the blood vessels in your nasal mucosa, which results in less blood flowing to the mucosa. Therefore, less fluid can leak out, and it decreases the inflammation, decreases your congestion. Now, I don't know about your mother, but my mother was overly cautious with every kind of medicine or anything we ever did. And when it came to nasal sprays, my mother said, you can only use it rarely. Because if you use it too much, you'll become addicted to it. That was what my mother said. Now, she wasn't correct, but she did have a reason for saying that. Because as you use these sort of pharmacologics, especially these stimulators, more and more, the cells that they are affecting get tired of hearing that signal so loud, so they downregulate their receptors. Much like you see a drug addict that gets stimulated over and over, over time, what happens to the amount of drug they need to have the same effect? Goes up. Because the receptors get downregulated. So the more of this you use, the fewer receptors that are going to be on the surface of that cell to be stimulated, so you're going to need more of the pharmacologic. 
So with many of these, especially these nasal sprays, you want to use them sparingly because the cells are going to acclimate to them anyway. I thought this was cool, just a little trivia. This was the nasal decongestant that was used on Apollo 11, the first moon landing. Because imagine in space you don't have gravity to help pull a lot of your body fluids into lower extremities. So they had a lot of congestion. I can't imagine how uncomfortable that must have been in space. So there's the mention of our down regulation of our alpha-2 receptors. Now the last pharmacologic is clonidine. And clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. Now remember, we said alpha-2 was principally in the brain. Negative feedback to the sympathetic nervous system. And it helped basically stop or slow down a sympathetic response. So this is a great antihypertensive agent. It's going to lower your blood pressure. And one of the additional great benefits of clonidine as an agent is going to be in children that have autism or hyperactivity. And I found this, I guess it was a family's blog. And it was interesting because here you got this little guy. And it looks like he had been eating something or doing some homework. I'm not sure what. But the parents say, clonidine, don't fail me now. This is how clonidine worked on Saturday night. So if you've ever been around autistic children or hyperactive children, they go nonstop. Their brains are constantly going. But all this little guy needed was just that sympathetic, adrenaline-filled activity to slow down just a little bit and enable him to go to sleep. So I like that image to help you remember, alpha-2 slow you down. And in some instances, that clinical intervention 